I think we're gonna go for it. Um, and all of you here now, the last day of DrupalCon at 8.30 in the morning, you are the true heroes, so way to go. Um, yeah, so this is uh, Drupal State and the need for a JavaScript SDK. So hopefully you're in the right place. I am uh, Brian Perry. I am a senior software engineer at Pantheon. I'm also the initiative coordinator for the Decoupled Menus Initiative, which we've been working on trying to kind of bring to a conclusion at Contrib events uh, this week. I live in the Chicago suburbs. I like uh, Drupal, JavaScript, and Nintendo. And I somewhat recently bought a uh, replica of Ms. Pac-Man machine, which I have in my office and I'm still very proud of. Um, I have a website, I'm on, uh, on Twitter, which although now is a horrible wasteland, and uh, I'm also on Drupal.org, and uh, feel free to get in touch. I also, uh, as I mentioned, work at Pantheon. Look at this great internet image loading here. Um, and uh, yeah, I want to thank uh, Pantheon for uh, sending me out here, and also especially uh, for allowing the time that I've had to contribute on some of the things that we'll be talking about today. A lot of the uh, projects that I've been working on in, in support of uh, decoupled sites are either currently open sourced or will be open sourced. Um, so it's been uh, really exciting work and I'm looking forward to what we have in the future. But uh, today we're going to be talking about a uh, specific library called Drupal State uh, that is uh, a general project on Drupal.org. It's published on NPM. It is a simple data store for managing application uh, state sourced from Drupal's JSON API. We'll talk about uh, you know, what that means, why uh, the library was created, why somebody might consider using it, and then also why I think uh, this library or something like it is important for the future of Drupal. Um, but also, we are going to take kind of a winding journey through the Drupal-related JavaScript ecosystem as well, so uh, buckle up. Um, yeah, we'll also look at uh, some uh, uh, code examples along the way, starting with uh, this one, which is a, a menu web component. So I talked about the decoupled menus initiative before. Uh, so there's a new endpoint that's going to be going into core that exposes uh, menu data. And uh, as part of the uh, hackathon last year at DrupalCon, um, a number of developers got together and tried to create different components to consume this data. So this is a, a web component that was created as part of a project uh, called Generic Drupal Web Components. Uh, if we take a look at this here, we'll see you know, we can expand the menu and there's uh, you know, menu data that comes in from Drupal. The uh, JavaScript file here, it, it's just importing the, the component itself and a style sheet. The markup is uh, where most of the magic happens here. So this is a uh, custom element. Um, GWC menu in this case, and we're passing in some different props, the branding for the, the title of the menu, and then we have the base URL of our, uh, our Drupal backend, so that's how this component knows uh, where to source its menu data from, uh, the menu machine name, and then a theme uh, uh, attribute as well. So we can change some of these things. So if I uh, take out the theme, it's unstyled, it's you know, just a, an unordered list here, but still has all of the menu hierarchy. If we change the menu ID to the account menu, we'll see that it, it pulls the account menu. And since we're not authenticated, there's just the login link. Um, but the idea here was to try to uh, build something that really makes it as simple as possible to consume uh, a particular set of data from Drupal in a web component like this. And how that happens behind the scenes, I can tran uh, transition here. Um, so the component itself is actually responsible for fetching the data. Web components have a handful of different lifecycle methods. This uh, connected callback is one of them. It essentially runs when the web component mounts so it runs a uh, fetch data function. We provide uh, the URL and the menu ID. So this is the code uh, for the fetch. It, nothing super complicated here. It kind of constructs the uh, endpoint that it needs to talk to on the Drupal side and then uses JavaScript fetch 
Um, and then also the menu response uses, uh, follows the, uh, this link set spec. So there's a supporting library that's used here to parse it so that it can easily represent the hierarchy and can be more easily easy to work with on the front end. So that all, all works nicely. Um, and you know, that's abstracted away from, uh, you know, it's embedded inside the component itself. However, after building that uh, component, you know, the next thing that I started looking at was, you know, can we make other components like this? And that, that approach definitely does not scale. So the first thing that you know, I looked at is making a card component. And for one card, uh, you know, having the logic inside the component to uh, go make a request to Drupal is fine. If you got 10 of them, that's 10 different calls. Uh, and 100, you, you got potentially some serious problems. Um, so that you know, led me to thinking like how, you know, how could there be something to support that type of problem. So from my perspective, this component library needed uh, you know, utilities to make it easy to source data from Drupal's API endpoints. And then something that would allow uh, that data, that application state to be managed across this component library and shared across different components, including ones that you know, we haven't built yet. And that, you know, that seems like something, uh, you know, given the work with decoupled Drupal and uh, the excitement around that, something that I would have expected to be, you know, a mostly solved problem. And for there to be, you know, things I could magically NPM install to do it. So I looked at, um, you know, projects I was familiar, in some cases not familiar with, in the uh, general decoupled Drupal ecosystem. Um, to see how they handled it. So uh, there is Druxt, which is a, a view project, and that has its own custom JSON API client. Uh, it uses Axios to fetch data. It uses a Vuex store, which is you know, a, a view um, state management uh, solution. Uh, the next for Drupal project, which you may be familiar with, and there's certainly been a lot of uh, talk about this week, um, they just recently had a major uh, release uh, 1.3 major in that there were some pretty substantial changes. Uh, before 1.3, it also had its own set of helper functions um, and didn't really have much of a opinion on state management. The 1.3 release introduces a, a Drupal client. Um, there's actually quite a bit in common with what that client does and this library. Um, I think we've all just kind of been looking at what all these similar projects are doing and how we've been solving this problem. Um, and it also has the ability to essentially provide your own caching mechanism. So uh, it's pretty easy to bring your own thing, but it doesn't necessarily have a default opinion about it. There's a handful of other uh, Drupal SDK-like libraries out there, Drupal SDK, Drupal JS SDK, all some of them in you know, different uh, levels of uh, activity and maintenance. And then for um, just general decoupled projects, um, oftentimes from my experience, you know, the code for this is custom and they roll their own solution. They might bring in their preferred state management library, like, you know, Redux on a React project and there's custom code written to fetch uh, data from Drupal. You know, it's not the most complicated thing in the world, but it, it's also something that, you know, is essentially getting written over and over and over again. So uh, I wondered, uh, you know, what would need to be created to prevent this problem from being solved over and over and over. Um, and from my perspective, uh, it would have to be something framework agnostic. So, um, you know, it could be used with Vue or React or Svelte or the JavaScript framework that's super cool in five years. Um, and then it also should have the ability to, um, you know, it should be possible to use the individual utilities within it. If somebody just wanted to use a piece of this, um, in their project or in another, you know, Drupal ecosystem related project, they should be able to do that. Um, and although I think it is useful for people to be able to still use something like this with their preferred state management solution, I do think there would be value in uh, a library like this that essentially has a default starting point for that, a default answer. And then I also, uh, you know, started thinking about uh, just JSON API itself while I was kind of brainstorming all of the world's problems here. Um, 
and wondering, you know, could the could working with JSON API be friendlier for JavaScript developers? Specifically, thinking about developers who might not be familiar with Drupal or might not be familiar with the JSON API spec. And you know, uh, the, Drupal's JSON API modules and JSON API ecosystem is uh, amazing, and it, it really can allow you to easily get data out of Drupal with limited configuration. Um, but as we'll see here in some of the things that we look at, there are certainly some things that you need to know going in or learn to be able to interact with it. So uh, let's actually just look at some examples of how you would, you know, could write some JavaScript to get data from JSON API. So um, we're getting uh, recipes here, the uh, demo umami data. Uh, you may know what Drupal's recipes endpoint is for your Drupal installation. Uh, however, at the root of JSON API, there's essentially an index of all of the uh, different API endpoints that are enabled. So if you don't know what the recipes endpoint is, you would hit the root of JSON API, get the response back to understand what the API endpoint that you need to reference to get the recipes is. And then you would need to fetch uh, that endpoint to get all of the recipes. So then we have um, all recipes under recipes from api.data here. And um, you know, if I wanted to print out the instructions, if we start to look at uh, the data that we get back here, um, you know, some data is at the top level. Other things are under attributes. So if I wanted to, to uh, print out the instructions, that would be under attributes.instructions. And we'll, we'll look a little bit more at this uh, in a few examples. But uh, things that are like referenced entities in Drupal in the response here are under relationships. And by default, we just get the ID here. So there's some additional work that we'd have to do if we want to get um, information for referenced entities. And then uh, let's imagine that we have, um, we got all of the recipes. And then later, we want to, uh, you know, just get one of them or just work with one particular recipe. So we could uh, make another request to JSON API for that specific recipe with the ID that we have. That would be a, a somewhat redundant request because we already had that data. So alternatively, we could do something to you know, store that you know, in a variable or in some sort of uh, state management solution. Um, but we would still have to go back through that, find the uh, you know, item at the particular ID to be able to have a representation of just that recipe. And then uh, this next example here, if it will let me click to the next thing. Come on. Here we go. Uh, so uh, this is uh, an example with uh, you know, a reference entity. So the recipes have a taxonomy term for category. So let's say that we wanted to get the category for a particular recipe. In this case, it's snack. So basically what we're trying to do here is get snack on the screen. Um, JSON API has a number of uh, query string parameters that you can provide. Um, so one of them is include. So we can say that we want to include the category. We just pop that on to the query string in the JSON API request that we make. And then uh, in the response that we get back, we'll see that there is a new section here included that has all of the included relationships. So there is a section that's going to have all of the categories and the category data. So if we wanted to uh, you know, print this particular category onto the screen, we have to, we'll have the ID in the, the um, main response for the entity, the ID of the category under relationships here. So we'd have to get that ID and then we'll have to, in the included uh, portion of the response, look up the category by that ID to be able to print out the category. So, you know, at the end of the day here, the category name here is, uh, you know, category, uh, the first item in the array, because there could be multiple categories, dot attributes, dot name. So a long, a long walk to 
uh, put snack on the screen in this case. Another common problem uh, that I've seen with uh, use of JSON API is overfetching data. So um, by default, JSON API will give you all of the data for you know, a particular resource. So if we had uh, like a grid of categories and we were just showing teasers, we might only need like four or so fields, um, but you're gonna get way, way more than that. And for large data sets, that can have a, a really meaningful impact on the payload. Uh, JSON API also supports this. So um, you know, we already added uh, this include category. Um, we can also put uh, query string parameters to dictate the fields that we want to get back in our response. So we can say fields, recipes, title, difficulty, instructions, and category if we wanted those. Uh, that's still not quite enough though because uh, we're, we will get back all of the data for the categories if we do that. So still a lot more that we need, especially if we're just printing snack on the screen. Um, so we would have to say fields, recipes, list out all those fields, and then fields, categories, and say that we just not want the name. So uh, totally possible to do that with JSON API, but you, know, you have to be familiar with the, you know, the spec Drupal's implementation of it. You have to construct that query string when you make your request. There is a library out there, a great library, uh, Drupal JSON a API params that provides some helper utilities to make that easier, adding those query string parameters. Um, but you know you have to have had found that library somehow. Okay, so this is um, the uh, that constructed response um, with all the query string parameters that we need. We're fetching that. Um, but you know the thing to kind of call out here is that even when we're very explicit about what we want and what fields we want, the shape of the response still might not be you know what you would assume you know based on some of the things that we looked at before. Some things are under the attribute section of the object. Uh, there's still the relationship section, and we still have to go into included to look up the category. So even though we basically said I want these four fields. Um, it's certainly not that clean in, in what we get back. So going back to overfetching, there also is uh, the, the, the GraphQL of it all. Um, for those who might not be familiar with GraphQL, it's, a, it's an alternate, alternate qu uh, query language um, that's pretty popular in the JavaScript ecosystem. And uh, it's good at solving this problem and preventing this type of overfetching because you essentially define the shape of your query and then uh, the response that comes back essentially follows that shape uh, exactly. Um, and uh, so with uh, Drupal, I personally haven't done a ton of work with GraphQL and the contributed uh, GraphQL module, but my understanding of kind of where that's at uh, in the Drupal world right now is so GraphQL is not uh, part of Drupal core. It's a contributed module. JSON API is part of core. Um, and then also there has been a little bit of, uh, I'll maybe even say growing pains going from the, the version three of GraphQL to version four. In that version three uh, works worked kind of a little bit uh, conceptually like what JSON API does in that it kind of automatically exposes all of your data. So version three would automatically generate a GraphQL schema so that you can just start querying all of your Drupal things. Uh, however, you know, that means that that schema kind of comes along with a lot of Drupalisms. So for version four, the change was made essentially so that that schema is not automatically generated by default, um, which means that it requires custom code to be able to essentially have a GraphQL API, but it'll be more tailored to your use case. Uh, um, Jesus uh, on the Octahedroid team, uh, a, a good friend uh, over, over at Pantheon, he's currently working on solving that problem um, and making some great progress there. So uh, hopefully that will improve soon and uh, version 4 will have some more flexibility uh, with that as well. So keep an eye on that. But, you know, uh, complicated to parse all that. So uh, finally getting back to uh, Drupal State and uh, you know, the, the attempt to solve some of these problems. Um, so how this library uh, tries to do that, it's uh, framework agnostic. So it's uh, vanilla JavaScript and you can use it with all of your favorite frameworks. 
it's universal. It can run server side and client side. Um, and you know, at the highest level, what it does is it gets an object uh, from Drupal's JSON API, and then it'll serve all future requests for that object from local state. So if you request uh, a JSON API endpoints and we don't have that object yet, it'll fetch it, but the next time that you ask for that object, it'll get it from state, or it'll, it'll try to get it from state first. And um, it uh, simplifies the response back, it deserializes the response by default, we'll see what that looks like. And all of the kind of underlying utility functions are also um, exported so they can be used individually. So if you just wanted to use some of the utilities to get data and you didn't want to have you know, this particular approach to state management or local storage, you don't have to. So uh, let's look at uh, essentially the same examples, uh, but what it would look like using this library. So uh, first you'll need to import it and then create an instance of, uh, of Drupal state. We create our store. So we provide the uh, API uh, base and then we can provide our uh, JSON API prefix. By default, that's JSON API. So if, uh, that, if it's not a different API prefix, you can just leave that off. Uh, there's some debug methods that you can enable to get more uh, debug output. But then to get all of the recipes, uh, we can, uh, with the store, say await store.getObject and then provide uh, the object name. So that's essentially the, the um, uh, resource in the uh, root JSON API index. So when we do that, we get back all of the data for the recipe. And then if we were to make here another a request for a particular recipe, we can also provide an ID to that get object method. Uh, it will first check the, the local data store to see if that recipe exists. It does because we already got all the recipes. So we'll just return it from state rather than making another request to JSON API. And then if we look at the uh, shape of the response here, it's uh, deserialized and, uh, and a lot flatter, so most of the things are at the top level. Um, there isn't things under the attributes uh, object. And we'll also look in a second um, how uh, reference entities uh, kind of fit into that. Okay, so this next uh, example here is um, yeah, what we looked at before with um, getting at the category for a, a taxonomy term, a reference entity. So um, this uh, Drupal state does use that Drupal JSON API params library as a dependency. So we have uh, helper methods for adding all of the different uh, JSON API uh, query string parameters. So we can say uh, params.addInclude category. So that's going to uh, say to include the category data. And then if we uh, get a particular recipe, uh, the response that we get back um, again, it's deserialized and flattened, so if we uh, scroll down a bit to the category, it's right at the top level, um, and also the uh, category data is deserialized as well. So if we want to print out, um, in this case, salad uh, on the screen, it's just recipe.category.name, and we don't have to kind of uh, climb through it to find our referenced entity there. And then this is an example of uh, an additional um, uh, utility. Uh, so uh, we're trying to also um, provide utilities for some of the popular um, uh, modules within the JSON API ecosystem. Uh, one of them is decoupled router. So that allows you to provide a, a path and decoupled router uh, goes through you know, any necessary redirects to try to resolve that path to an entity in Drupal. So we have this get object by path method, um, which you can provide the object name and also the path. And if we have the path for our fiery chili sauce recipe, um, we get back uh, the data for that particular recipe. And then this is an example of, of using the underlying uh, function that does that work. So if you didn't want to use uh, the state management piece of, of Drupal state, but you found this particular utility useful for uh, working with decoupled router, you could just use this translate path function. So you can import translate path, 
from Drupal state and then just call that function. And it takes in the um, uh, your uh, decoupled router endpoint and the path uh, that you, you want to get. And this just gets the raw response in this case from decoupled router. And this is a look at the, the code for that function. Um, you know, it's certainly not that complicated, not a whole lot of code here, um, but you know, why write this over and over if uh, this is a, a utility, you know, a, a solved problem that could be helpful for you. It, it basically just constructs uh, the necessary uh, query string parameters that have to be passed to decoupled router. And, you know, it, it's able to use other utilities from this library. So there's, um, you know, default methods for fetch. Uh, that we use a library called uh, JSONA for uh, JSON API TypeScript types. Um, yeah, so, you know, this is an example of something that, you know, not the most complicated thing to write, but, you know, maybe you don't have to write it. And this is kind of getting into uh, a feature that uh, I still consider a little experimental at this point. Um, but, you know, we talked about uh, GraphQL and also that, you know, that's kind of a, uh, a common and popular approach to querying in the, uh, the JavaScript ecosystem. So uh, there's an additional feature here where you can provide lightweight uh, GraphQL queries in your requests. So we have this uh, query here, and we provide the title, difficulty, instructions, and then category name. And the response that we get back, uh, as we see on the right, really clean and you know, just follows the shape of that response. Um, this is using uh, 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 Apollo Client. And Apollo Client has the concept of uh, a link, which is basically something that kind of stands in the middle in between uh, your API and your request to the client and can do things. Um, and there is a, a, another uh, package out there that actually provides a translation layer uh, in between JSON API endpoints and creates a, a GraphQL schema, um, which sounds like magic, but it, it, as we see here, it, it does work. Um, so the reason this is experimental, uh, in my opinion, I think we just need to put this through its paces more to see where the limitations of it are. Um, it also depends on uh, the GraphQL Anywhere library, which I, I believe isn't being actively maintained. So we'll need to figure out if there could be a replacement there or exactly what that would mean, having that as a dependency. Um, but uh, yeah, I think this could uh, be you know, a, a nice developer experience uh, nicety here. The other thing that this actually does is because we get the query and you know, essentially the developer here is describing uh, the shape that they want and all of the fields that they want, uh, because we know those fields behind the scenes, we're actually adding the, uh, the field parameters to the outgoing JSON API responses so that it's by default using a sparse field set. So uh, behind the scenes, it's also cutting down the size of the payload. So my hope here is that even though having this translation layer in the middle has a cost, um, being able to kind of automate getting a small payload maybe balances that out. But you know, we can also measure that too. Everybody, how's everybody doing? Still good? Still rocking our Thursday? All right, awesome. Uh, Okay, so uh, now going all the way back to uh, where we started with uh, the generic Drupal web components project. Um, so obviously huge, we took a huge tangent and focused on uh, Drupal state to hopefully make it possible to um, build more uh, Drupal friendly web components. And now we find ourselves that, you know, if, uh, you know, state management and some of these ways to get data from JSON API are solved, the hope is that projects like this and others can focus on the stuff that's going to make their, you know, decoupled project unique. So uh, this is um, uh, a couple of components that were created in that generic Dr Drupal Web Components library that uses Drupal state. And uh, in a, a previous version of this talk, I had uh, kind of an initial uh, approach to this. Um, but uh, Andy Bloom from uh, Lullabot uh, provided uh, some feedback and some examples and have refactored uh, the approach here. 
uh, to something that I think uh, works even better, which we'll take a look at in a second, but definitely hat tip uh, to him. Um, and also, uh, if you want to mess around with web components, uh, definitely uh, would be interested in others who want to contribute to this library. But anyway, uh, so we're importing, in this case, all of the components from uh, generic Drupal web components. Again, the magic here is happening uh, in the, the markup. So we have a couple more custom elements. So the top level is the GDWC store. So that's you know, essentially the instance of Drupal state that we saw before, passing in similar parameters. And uh, that gives you a data store and that the state management uh, you know, at that element. And then inside of a store, there can be one or more providers, like we see here. There's just one provider. And you can think of that as essentially the, you know, the uh, get object requests that we saw before. So a provider can uh, try to get a, uh, an object uh, from Drupal's JSON API. What it does is it, it talks to the store, and it makes its request to JSON API, stores that in the, the local data store, and then uh, we'll start playing around with this in a second, but the uh, inside of a provider, you can have a template. This is actually the uh, HTML template element uh, that are used for custom elements. And that template has, its scope is the uh, provider that it's inside of. So it has access to essentially all of the data that the provider gets back. So in this particular example, we're saying that we want uh, one particular recipe with this ID, and uh, we're also including um, some uh, image re re reference here. But so now we have access to that recipe. So I can just write regular HTML markup here if I want. Uh, and then uh, double braces is the, the format that I, I used here. But if we just say title, we have our deep Mediterranean quiche in this case. Um, so this can be just any uh, regular, good old-fashioned HTML. It, uh, what's in this template could also be web components. So it could be uh, web components from this generic Drupal web components library, but it also could be any other web component uh, you know, with this approach. The, the previous version of this required there to be some logic inside of the uh, generic Drupal web components components to kind of hook into this. But by using this template and you know, essentially making these variables available to the template, just literally any elements uh, can be used here. So for example, phase two this week unveiled, uh, I think it's Outline, which is a web components library. I, I tried to chat uh, with uh, one of the phase two folks yesterday about this, but like that library could be used with these two components uh, to get data from a JSON API and then do all sorts of fun things with that really cool web component library they're building. Um, but let's look at an uh, example, a little copy and paste for presentation sanity here. But if we wanted to use, uh, we did create a kind of an initial pass at a card component. So if I wanted to use the card here in the template here, um, we have our, our image in the card. Um, the summary uh, is being provided here. There's also another prop that we can pass in for, I believe, the headline. So if we make the headline the title, oh, headlin. So now we have uh, our card, our, our image, our, our deep Mediterranean quiche. Um, another thing that uh, the, the provider does, so if uh, you just get one item back, it, it will render the template, but if the uh, the scope has an array of results, it'll iterate over the template. So if I take away the ID here, so I get multiple recipes back, we'll see that I have uh, you know, eight or so recipes um, that it spits out. And then you know, again, because this is just uh, you know, uh, the HTML template element, I, I can even do things like if I want this to be in a grid, you know, I can create a style element. You know, this probably isn't the way you would actually want to maintain your CSS, but um, I can reference the host element. So the host is essentially the container of the custom element. And then hunched over my keyboard here, I can display grid, GERD. 
my like my living nightmare is typing in front of people. <laughs> um, okay, display grid, and then I'll make it maybe a two by two uh, grid. Uh, GERD, perfect. Grid template. Oh God. I think part of the problem is that I can't talk. My son like uh, plays video games and like streams on YouTube and like he can't not talk while he plays uh, video games. I just, I don't get it. Um, one FR, one FR and uh, I can't not have the, uh, the gap here. So I'll put that in. Cool, so yeah, now a, a grid of, uh, of recipes. And uh, yeah, that just seems really flexible and like this was the, you know, what I was hoping that this uh, library could have as far as being able to have a solution for managing uh, state from Drupal that can be easily shared. Um, but this approach, I think, you know, goes even beyond this library. Um, you know, I, I could see people using just these two elements with you know, stuff unrelated to the components that are provided in generic Drupal web components. So pretty excited about it. All right, uh, so uh, a few things uh, as we kind of uh, come, come back from our, our journey. Um, so given all of this, given the like a year or so tangent uh, that, uh, you know, led to this library and uh, those components that we just looked at, um, where, where could we go from here? What could we do next? So uh, I performed a very unscientific survey uh, as a way to um, answer that, which is searching on NPM, which is a thing that I think uh, you know, JavaScript developers do do. So if you search for Drupal on NPM, this is the result that you get back. The first thing is an implementation of parts of Drupal's user access control API, and then a JavaScript implementation of the hashing algorithm used in Drupal. Um, and then there eventually down at the bottom is a, is Drupal SDK, but, um, you know, is that Drupal's SDK? There are other ones that are in the results. Like it, it's for somebody just searching Drupal on NPM, this is, uh, you know, probably not clear, uh, where to go from here. If you are, uh, if you know to look under an NPM organization, there is a Drupal organization, uh, right now there are just two, uh, pretty specific packages an implementation of uh, a replacement for jQuery once, an accessible autocomplete. These are things that are, um, I believe, actually used in core, or at least that's the intent. Um, but, you know, there is the opportunity here and some of the work that the decoupled menus initiative and the creation of, of general projects uh, in Contrib opens the door to having more things under the, the Drupal namespace here. Uh, alternatively, like let's look at searching WordPress. Uh, searching WordPress gives you a, a more sane set of results, from my opinion. Uh, the first result is a client for working with WordPress. And then there are a number of uh, libraries under the WordPress org. I think a lot of that is driven by the block editor because that's uh, in React. So I assume these are also a lot of things that are actually used inside of WordPress. But, you know, it, this definitely uh, looks like a kind of more consistent set of WordPress-related uh, JavaScript projects. And then uh, Sitecore, uh, so Sitecore also has um, a set of um, APIs and uh, essentially like a, an SDK. Um, so if you search for Sitecore, um, there also are a number of libraries, uh, you know, specifically for interacting with Sitecore in a JavaScript uh, application. And then uh, if you search for Contentful, I know that this is not necessarily a one-to-one -one, uh, example because Contentful is a exclusively headless CMS. Um, but obviously there are utilities to help you get data from Contentful in the JavaScript application that you're building. And imagine a developer who is familiar with this and maybe is moving on to a project where they're going to have to talk to Drupal, uh, you know, the first thing they might do is search for Drupal on NPM and expect to see a set of utilities like this. And today that doesn't exist. So uh, what could we do to make that better? Um, there, as I mentioned before, there could be more uh, tools under the Drupal namespace 
or something like it. Uh, you know, another thing that uh, has uh, been suggested as an idea, uh, Mike Herschel at a previous version of this talk said, you know, maybe there could be like a Drupal contrib namespace under NPM or something like that. But um, yeah, something more kind of clearly collected as Drupal projects on NPM. Uh, I do think that there should be a uh, some sort of official Drupal JavaScript client, um, as you can probably tell. <laughs> and, you know, obviously I've been working on a library that solves some of those problems, but I think the more important thing from my perspective is that there is something that fills that need. Um, and then also, uh, this is kind of an offshoot from the decoupled menus initiative, but um, there really isn't uh, much uh, documentation on decoupled Drupal on Drupal.org. Um, and I think having some documentation and some, kind of some clearer uh, examples and best practices there would also help quite a bit. So, uh, you know, what, what could the actual next steps be? You know, we're all here collaborating and, and working together. Um, one thing could be uh, promoting uh, projects, existing projects to the Drupal namespace. Um, that could be, you know, I think that could be useful, but also a, a good exercise to try to determine like, what are the rules around that? What, what is appropriate for that namespace? What isn't? Uh, the Drupal JSON API params is something that, that this library depends on. I believe Druxt has it as a dependency. Uh, it's a, a great utility that's adopted by the community. That, that could be a place to start. Um, I've actually had it on my list to try to open an issue to propose doing that. Um, and I, I do think, I do believe that there should be efforts to actually, you know, work on and build and create some sort of official client or SDK for Drupal, a JavaScript client to interact with Drupal. Um, so uh, this week I created an issue in the uh, ideas uh, queue. Here's the link. Um, I've also tweeted it out previously in the week. So I would love anybody's feedback on that, uh, to hear thoughts, uh, even if it is just to pop in and say like, hey, I think this is a good idea, or hey, I, I, uh, I went to Brian's talk, and I think it's a terrible idea. Uh, either one of those would be useful too. Um, and then additionally, uh, as part of the decoupled menus initiative, um, there was a, like initial outlining and a lot of thoughts around like, what would a guide to decouple Drupal be? And uh, we're, trying to focus on declaring like the menus part of the decoupled menus initiative complete. So we kind of broke the scope of, of that out. Um, but I think there could be the opportunity for a more organized effort around trying to actually create some decoupled Drupal documentation. There is a, a section that was created uh, under the developer guide on drupal.org that is a home for that and essentially has the outline. So. Uh, the home is there, and we could start furnishing it if there are people who are interested in that. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is the last day of DrupalCon, so uh, you know, a lot of the contribution has happened, but I'll be, uh, for as much of the day as possible, in the contrib space. Uh, there's a bunch of issues in the Drupal State issue queue. There's that ideas uh, queue issue that I mentioned. For the decoupled menus initiative, the things that we're trying to uh, get across the finish line this week is um, there's a uh, core issue for the endpoint, getting the endpoint into core. We're really close. Uh, I've had uh, some great help this week. I see Gabe here, thanks for your help yesterday. Uh, we just need to wrap up some tests for that. So if there's anybody who's better at tests than me, come find me. Uh, and uh, the, we have, uh, essentially a documentation page that's specific to decoupled menus. There's just some revisions we're hoping to make there, wrap that up. Um, and then there also is that generic Drupal web components library. And I think that can definitely be a space for people to just create new web components. Um, so if you're interested in doing that, let's talk. And if you're uh, interested in anything else in this space or just want to chat about this stuff, um, I would love to talk more. And uh, I think we do have some time for questions with this very aggressive discussion slide. So thank you. Yes. Much appreciated. And again, you're all the true heroes Thursday morning, but uh, questions. Benji. And I will try to remember to repeat the question because I know you would tell me to do that.
unfortunately seen they with a vocabulary such as type or attribute. Isn't that your problem? I wouldn't be doing my job if I wasn't making Benji nervous in some way. Um, that is totally valid. What I think that, oh yeah, well, oh my God. So Benji's question was uh, uh, flattening out the response, deserializing it, isn't there a risk of conflicts for similarly named things? That is definitely true. Um, what I would like to see the library do is have that as an option. So if you didn't want that to be deserialized, you could uh, not have that done. I do think the, the, the value in doing that is, uh, uh, you know, outweighs the risk, but that is a, a valid concern. Yes. So does the, does the library help with posting data back to the server at all? The question was, does the library help with posting data back to the server? Um, it does not now, but that seems like a really natural thing for it to expand out to doing. Or, or you know, whatever ends up being Drupal's SDK. Any other questions? Yes. Does pagination work? Is there a, a so uh, JSON API uh, by default uh, will only give you a certain number of results. It might be 50, um, 50. And then beyond that, it pages, which is great. It's great that it has pagination. Um, but a lot of times people just want to get all results. Uh, the library does handle that. There is a, a, a get all option. So you can pass that in and it'll, it'll get all results and behind the scenes, it goes through all the pages. So, it, and that's another example of something that a lot of people do. It's code that people are writing over and over. And I think it's useful that there's utilities that just take care of that. Other questions? Yes. So the question was, uh, uh, the question slash statement was uh, that uh, being able to provide a GraphQL query with this library seems really powerful. Was all that you needed to do to do that to provide the, the query in the get object request? And yes. That was a nice succinct, yes. Okay, that, that, is, uh, that is a good question uh, that I need to clarify then. So, and I can totally understand how you would jump to this conclusion because again, it seems like this shouldn't be possible, but the, what the library does now is it allows you to write those uh, GraphQL queries against Drupal's JSON API. So the GraphQL uh, module in that example is, is actually not installed and enabled. It's essentially a way to have the convenience of writing a GraphQL-like query against JSON API. However, I, I do think that this library or especially, you know, Drupal's official client uh, should also have some sort of prepackaged uh, library to interact with the GraphQL uh, module. So, um, and uh, Drupal State uses Apollo client, uh, uh, at least for the, the, that GraphQL link thing. Um, so it would be pretty easy to provide, uh, you know, a client instance that could talk to uh, GraphQL, but that, yeah, that hasn't, the work there hasn't been done yet. Any other questions? Yes. So the question uh, was, uh, uh, they like the fact that uh, the data gets cached, but they wonder about a case where the data is stale. Another thing that uh, I've run into is the, a legitimate example, like let's say that you make your initial request for just certain fields and later you want other fields. Uh, does the library handle that? It, it does not right now. I think that's a, a big area for improvement. There are issues in the issue queue about it. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a bit of a rabbit hole. It's a pretty challenging problem, but I think something that this library or a library like it uh, would need to solve. So if anybody, anybody wants to lend a hand. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Gabe. So the first question was, what if you decide to let the data 
the first time you land on a page, how does it decide what to fetch? I, I, I don't follow, actually. So you, in the, to get the, the data the way that you call the library, you, you're essentially telling it. So you would have to say, get object. And if you wanted a page in that case, you would say, get object and provide the ID, or you could use decoupled router to determine what, what page is related to that route. But, but basically, it knows because you tell it. Yes? Yeah, so to try to summarize that, uh, so right now the web component example that essentially uh, uses Drupal state requires some sort of component hierarchy. And the question essentially is, uh, could there be multiple stores that share a store? Uh, or, you know, it, Yes. Yeah, so the answer to that is, is actually it does that now. So you could have one store and then multiple providers inside it. Any, any child provider in it accesses the same store. Another kind of question that, that I've heard about this approach is, you know, yeah, does it have to have that rigid component structure? Uh, there, uh, there could be ways to have that be part of the, the global namespace so that it, it's possible to access that. Uh, my general understanding is, is like from a JavaScript perspective, that's kind of an anti-pattern. Um, so I don't know, it's something that could be considered, but uh, again, that's another thing. Like I, I also consider this very early. So any feedback, any ways that we might be able to make that more useful, totally open to it. Thank you. Any other questions? Great questions. All right, everybody's off the hook, but thank you so much. This was great and I'm proud of you all.